All right. Uh, happy Wednesday to everybody. I know it's noon because the sirens are going off. They're doing siren tests today, at least over here in um, East Dallas. So it's good to have you all with us. Happy Wednesday. And um, we are going to be talking about the kingdom of God again today, part five. Um, so some quick announcements as people join us. Um, yay, Danielle is with us today. Uh, and uh, we missed you last week. Um, so just a couple quick announcements. One, uh, we are going to be starting, if you have not signed up for a Lyft Life Group, uh, please do, because we are finishing up our study on uh, by Stephen Furtick, uh, Unqualified. And next week is the last week for that study. Um, it's been great, um, and I'm actually excited about the lesson um, for this week. Um, and then uh, next week we'll finish it up, and um, it's called uh, Reaching the Goal. Uh, but then, then after that, we're starting a new study called Unafraid. Uh, he says, Unafraid, Living with Courage and Hope in Uncertain Times by Adam Hamilton. Um, this will be a 10-week study. It's a little bit long, but it's totally worth it. And I think it's totally um, appropriate for where we're at right now um, in our world with everything that's going on with COVID, with all of the protests and um, the need for some serious systematic change um, in terms of how uh, policing happens here in the United States. Um, so uh, it's this is a really good study. Uh, I'm excited about it. Um, and essentially it is, uh, Jesus said, do not be afraid, right, about anything. Doesn't mean that you're not going to go through tough times, but when you do, you don't have to fear it. And uh, so some of the topics are understanding, encountering fear. Uh, he touches on crime, race, terrorism, and politics. Failure, disappointing others, insignificance, and loneliness. Um, I think that loneliness one is going to be a big one right now as we've been um, sheltering in place and, and uh, having to uh, shelter, social distance, you know, right now. Um, the apocalypse, <laughs> that's going to be a good one, right? Uh, change, missing out, FOMO, fear of missing out. And finances, big one right there, especially right now with uh, a lot of people losing jobs and things because of COVID-19, aging, illness, dying, and fear of the Lord. I mean, I think this is good stuff. So uh, we are going to be uh, doing Unafraid in um, two weeks. So if you haven't signed up for a small group, please do that now because this is going to be a good one. You don't want to miss out. All right. Um, well, let's get started. Um, and I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer, and then um, we will jump in. So let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for um, this opportunity to gather together, even virtually, uh, to discuss uh, the Word of God, to discuss a scripture, to discuss the, your kingdom and what that looks like here on earth. Um, we ask for your Holy Spirit to reach out to all of us that uh, hear these words. May they be blessed. May you use these words and speak through me, Lord, to touch each heart that we might draw closer to you and to each other. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. If um, you are online and haven't check in with me, just kind of say, hey, so I know that you are with us. All right. So um, this is part five, and we're going to talk about power. And to be quite honest, when um, I decided after we finished the Fruit of the Spirit, to, to do the kingdom of God, I actually had this in mind the whole time. Like, this is the one I've been wanting to do. I'm excited about this. I hope that you all are blessed and, and get a lot out of it. Um, we are only going to look at three scriptures, and actually one is just our main one, which is Mark 1, 14 through 15, which is Jesus' announcement of why he came, um, which is to promote the kingdom of God and the good news of the kingdom of God. And, and, but then the other two are going to be our, our, the main ones that we focus on, and they are both from the Gospel of Matthew. But if you want to turn to the Gospel of Mark, which is, as I've said before, the oldest gospel, the earliest gospel, is written about 30 years after the resurrection, and Matthew and Luke base their gospels off of Mark. And so if you want to turn in your Bible, or look at your phone, or whatever you use for um, 
reading scripture. Hey, Amanda, Amanda's on. All right. What time is it in Africa? I'm glad you joined us. Um, Amanda has been in Africa on um, lockdown for many months now. Um, so we are looking forward to when she can come back and join us here in the United States. She's part of my small group, and uh, honestly, we miss, uh, miss having her. Um, all right, so Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, uh, if you want to follow along. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news, the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, the time um, is at hand, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So this is Jesus' mission. This is the thesis statement of Mark's gospel. Um, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, repent and believe in the good news. So the kingdom of God is central to what Jesus came to do, to teach us, to show us, to demonstrate to us. Um, so we have been talking for the last four weeks about what that, what that means. And uh, last week we talked about the fact that the kingdom of God is about compassion, that that's the key to um, initiating the kingdom of God here on earth. Jesus demonstrated compassion in all that he did, and it was necessary for the work that the apostles did when they took over from him as when he ascended uh, to God. So um, this week we're talking about power. What does that look like? And um, what is the good news about the kingdom of God? And um, if it is good news, then it has to be good news for everyone. Otherwise, it isn't good news for anyone, right? The kingdom of God is for everyone. So if it's for everyone, then it has to be good news for everyone. And if it isn't good news for everyone, then it's not good news for anyone, all right? So um, this is why power, we're talking about power is going to be so important, because power, um, the way that we understand power, and the question for consideration that I put down there is, how do you view power? Um, and um, its use, and actually, I don't see my question here, I don't, uh, so I don't, I, I know I, I said, how do you view power, so that's basically how do you understand power, how do you view power and its use, and understand power, um, because it's different, I guarantee you, in God's kingdom, um, than, than we see it demonstrated here on earth. Um, all right, so, Power. What is power? How do you view power? If you want to put that in the comments, what, what your understanding of power is, feel free to. But when we talk about kingdoms, and we're talking about the kingdom of God, we often think about power. And um, Monday night, my small, my Lyft small group, we meet on Monday nights. And um, uh, Anne Marie Holste uh, Holstead, if you know her, uh, is a huge Game of Thrones fan. And um, she was talking about how one of the characters in the Game of Thrones series. Um, was very benevolent and seemed to be really concerned about people and what was best for people, freeing slaves and, and doing good with her use of power. Um, but then when she became sort of all-powerful, it corrupted her, and then suddenly she um, um, was no longer this benevolent leader. And so um, that's often what happens. You've heard that saying before, um, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And uh, that's actually the phrase we were discussing um, in our life group on Monday when she mentioned Game of Thrones. And I think that's how we tend to view power. Um, and we, uh, but uh, that's not how power is in God's kingdom. And power is important when we talk about God's kingdom, not just because it is a kingdom, but because we pray in the Lord's Prayer at the end um, for uh, your will, to, your kingdom to come, your will be done. And as at the end of the Lord's Prayer, we say, uh, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, right? God's power forever. And so that's the first one we're going to, the first scripture we're going to look at. If you will turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament. If uh, you're looking for that in your Bible, it's the first gospel, the first book in the New Testament. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And this is when the disciples have asked um, that Jesus to teach them how to pray, and he gives them the Lord, what we call the Lord's Prayer, or the Our Father. Um, and uh, if we um, pick up in verse 9, it says, pray then in this way. Jesus says, pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Uh, and then there's a footnote that says, this in 13 it says, and do not bring us to the time of trial and rescue us from the evil one. There's a footnote that says, and some um, ancient authorities add for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever, which we say, that is the, the um, uh, traditional understanding of the Lord's Prayer and the way that, that it's taught, it's been taught since really the earliest days of the church, and is that we say, um, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Well, and uh, the Greek word for power that's used in the Gospel of Matthew is dunamis. It's where we get our word dynamite from. It means explosive power. Um, but this is the thing, and this is why it's so critical when we say, for the kingdom is yours, the power and the glory, because it's not um, power or might as in over other people. It actually refers to mighty, miracle, wonder-working power. It's about the supernatural power of God. So when we say the kingdom of your, the kingdom is yours and the power is yours, we're not talking about um, the power to rule over the earth and, and everything in it and on it, including us, um, even though that is God's right and God is over all the earth. Um, we're saying the supernatural power, the miracle, wonder-working power um, is yours. And that's what Jesus came to demonstrate, right? That power is God's power. And that's the power we're talking about when we pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Um, speaking of an, the next series after, um, if we continue doing these with, since we're all sheltered in place with COVID, um, maybe um, doing a um, series on uh, the Lord's Prayer might be a, a good thing to do. Um, but so when we're talking about power in the kingdom of God, we're talking about the miracle, wonder-working power of God. And how did Jesus demonstrate what that power looked like? Um, he, he healed people. Um, he cured, the scripture says he cured every disease and healed every sickness. Um, he cast out demons. He raised the dead. Um, that's the miracle, wonder-working power that belongs to God. And that's what we're praying when we pray that God's kingdom come on earth, is that God's supernatural power come. Uh, and uh, and touch us and touch our lives. Um, it's what we pray for when we pray for healing, when we're sick, when we know those are sick, when we pray for the needs of others. We're asking for God's supernatural power to intervene in this earth to bring about God's good, right? To bring about God's good. Um, so when, we, when we're talking about power, we're not talking about a king who tells other people what to do. And often I think when we think of kingdoms and power, we think of kings who um, order armies to go out and, and conquer lands and, um, and, and you know, tell their servants what to do and things like that. But that's not at all what um, the power of God is when we're talking about power in God's kingdom. One, we're talking about supernatural power. And then what does that power look like? How is it demonstrated? Um, there's a second type of power. And it's, it, that's aside from the supernatural power we pray in the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to look at that power right now. And that is in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 27. So if you will turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 27. And that says, um, so uh, this is... Uh, the request of the mother of James and John. So James and John were two of Jesus' disciples, and their mother comes to Jesus and says, hey, when you come into your power in the kingdom of God, when your kingdom comes, um, I want both of my sons to sit, on one to sit on your right hand and one to sit on your left hand, right? And the, and the, the, the other disciples, when they find out about this, they're furious, they're really upset. It says, when the 10 heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. Mm, yeah, I bet. <laughs> but Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. Right? So worldly power, earthly powers, those in, in power here on earth, rule over people and are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. Okay, listen to this. We're talking about power in the kingdom of God. It will not be so among you. But whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. 
Um, and so when we're talking about power in God's kingdom, we're talking about serving others. We're talking about true power in God's kingdom is about serving others. Um, we've talked about this before, and I mentioned it again, but um, uh, doulos is the Greek word that uh, Jesus used when he referred to um, the type of servant that he was. And that is the lowest form of a slave. It is the person who had no rights at all. Um, and that's who Jesus identified with. And that's who he's telling the disciples. True power in the kingdom of God is the one who is the least, um, who, is, who, who is the one who has no power, right? So he who has power in the kingdom of God is the one who, according to a worldly view of power, has no power. Um, it is the least. So power in the kingdom of God looks like powerlessness, right? It is, looks like weakness. Um, Paul said all the time um, that uh, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Um, that um, God has put his power in jars of clay, referring to us. We're broken. Um, we're fallen. We, we make mistakes. We hurt one another. We... We do not demonstrate the kingdom of God in, in how we live out our lives um, um, often. I mean, we try, but, and the Holy Spirit is there to help us, but we, we often miss the mark and make mistakes. Um, but, uh, and that's that weakness like the, that uh, we are the jars of clay that God's power shines through. And, but power in God's kingdom, it's not, it's, not the, it's not the supernatural power or this one, although some people may have that gift. Um, I, I pray for that gift myself all the time. Um, but because uh, Paul said to eagerly desire all the gifts of God, uh, but that power in the kingdom of God looks like weakness. It is serving one another. It is the lowest of the low. Um, and so it looks like serving one another uh, and in love in love and that's the power in the kingdom of god serving one another in love that's the power in the kingdom of god um, this is kingdom power this is the transformational power of god it is the love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness um, and self-control um, that god gives us lived out that's what power in god's kingdom looks like um, and as we talked about last week it's compassion compassion for others that's power in the kingdom of god now, I want to talk quickly about the context of Matthew. Why did, why, because, you know, we've looked at two scriptures in Matthew where we talk about power and that um, it looks differently than um, what we consider worldly power. Why is this so important to Matthew? And why does he, he bring this up? Well, one, Jesus talked about it and demonstrated it. But two, um, the Gospel of Matthew was written in between 80 and 90 A.D., or um, the Common Era, C.E., depending on how you want to designate that. So 80, between 80 and 90 C.E., Common Era, which is 10 to 20 years after the Temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome in 70 uh, C.E. Um, so this is fresh for Matthew. This is 10 years 10 to 20 years after the temple's been destroyed. And you have to understand, Matthew is Jewish. He's writing primarily to a Jewish audience, which is different from Mark. The Gospel of Mark was actually written by, um, uh, was written for Gentiles. That's why when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you see uh, descriptions of why um, certain Jewish customs are followed. And you don't have that in Matthew because Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. He expects them to already understand why certain Jewish traditions are followed. But so this is fresh for Matthew, right? It's 10 to 20 years after the temple has been destroyed. And the temple was the center of Jewish life. And um, so it, it's, this is a huge blow to the Jewish people, right? Uh, the temple is destroyed and suddenly that which was the center of, of, their, of their faith and their life together in community and how they lived, they have to figure out a new way to live, right? They don't have the, it, the temple anymore is not the center of their faith and how they live as a community, and they have to figure out how do we, how do we live out our faith now that we don't have a temple anymore. Like, this is huge, and this is fresh for Matthew. So when he's talking about power, he has seen what 
worldly power looks like and what it does to communities, how it destroys communities, right? We know when we look at um, history um, that when a conqueror comes into a, to a land, they, what well, is the first thing they do? They make the, the, the people that they're conquering speak their language, worship their gods, uh, follow their cultural norms and, and, and so on. Um, they take away, they strip away what made those people unique um, and uh, that includes their faith and religious practices, right? You have to follow our gods now. You can't follow your gods. Um, and, and so um, Matthew understands this is how worldly power works. And it's destructive. It destroys people. It destroys communities. It destroys lives. Um, and this is fresh in Matthew's mind. So when he's talking about the kingdom of God is one um, that looks like powerlessness, that, that, that caters to the weak and the least, he knows what he's talking about, and he feels it deeply, all right? Um, now, I do want to touch on Pax Romana. Uh, Pax Romana was um, a uh, form that Rome eventually, after they had become this huge power war, you know, taken over mo most of, of, of the world, they, um, uh, they developed a sy system, what became known as Pax Romana, which is the Peace of Rome and where they would allow certain people groups that they had conquered to continue um, their particular religious practices and things. Um, and some, some sects of Judaism had um, received an exemption from Rome to continue to practice their particular ways of, of, of being. Um, but um, it is, you know, before the destruction of the temple and after the temple, they, they, were, they allowed this. Um, but still, it was with a, that they were considered strange and other because they didn't follow Roman customs or worship Roman gods. Um, now, the reason why I bring that up is because <laughs> and since we're talking about power and how we view power and understand power, I was teaching on this at another church. I had been invited to speak um, a, one evening at another church, and I was sharing this, that this was the context that Matthew was writing in. And a sophomore in high school came up to me afterwards, and she said um, that she had just finished a study of Rome as part of her world history class, and her teacher had told them that Rome was not violent, but benevolent, and that's why it lasted so long. And I said, you know, I really respectfully disagree, and I think if, if you go and do some study on your own, you're going to discover that's not true. And she said, no, that's what my teacher said. And, and so I... I really, really have some big concerns about that. Um, I had to respectfully disagree with her teacher and wonder what is the reason why they would teach this to students. And I'm just going to read to you briefly some of my own thoughts after this encounter that I recorded after a student, you know, this, she shared this with me. We do a disservice to history if we do not retell of the horrors that humans are willing to commit against other humans. To overlook this is to doom us from recognizing it when it begins to invade our lives again. Right? History repeats itself. Humans are good. People in power are going to um, obstruct and oppress other humans. It's, it has continued since, since the fall. It's, got, it's not going to stop until Jesus returns. So we do a disservice when we try and, and, and paint um, conquerors as being benevolent and kind and nonviolent. Um, blind trust of those in power is what the gospel challenges. I'm going to say that again. Blind trust of those in power is what the gospel challenges. Gospel means good news. And if it isn't good news for everyone, it isn't good news for anyone. That's what I said at the beginning. If it isn't good news for everyone, it isn't good news for anyone. And if you have people coming in, taking away your language, your custom, your religion, telling you who you can and can't worship, um, then it's not good news. It's not good news, right? Um, all right, so power, I'm going to wrap this up. Power in God's kingdom is power that serves others in love. Um, it particularly focuses on the least and the downtrodden in society. It's miracle wonder working power. Um, it's uh, Jesus. He, and, and, uh, this is important too. Look, when we look at the life of Jesus, okay, when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus did not come to the powerful, to the elite. Um, he, he didn't come to the halls of power. He came to the poor, the downtrodden. 
he, he uh, came to those who were poor and forgotten, right? That's who the kingdom of God was first demonstrated to. Um, you know, there's a lot of historians who think that, that one of the, the, the downfalls for, for Christianity um, was when um, Constantine became a Christian and made it sort of the religion of the empire. Um, you know, I, I mean, you, you can argue that one way or the other, and I'm not arguing one way or the other on that either. Um, obviously, I think it's great that Constantine um, became a Christian, um, because I think that's what we all want. It's, but it's what, when we become a Christian, is that we want to demonstrate power as it is in the kingdom of God, which is that we serve the least and care for those who are the forgotten ones of society. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think Constantine did that as, a, as, as the emperor. Um, you know, he, he continued the, the policies and practices of what worldly powers do, which is what Jesus said in Matthew 20, which is they, they become tyrants and they oppress other people. All right, well, I hope you've gotten a lot out of this and enjoyed it, and it's been beneficial to you. Um, thank you for joining us for um, our study on the kingdom of God. And uh, I want to pray for us as we close. Um, and uh, just a reminder that, um, you know, we won't be gathering together for worship um, anytime soon until we know we can do it safely. So just continue to look for um, those uh, newsletters that come out on, uh, on Saturday mornings, reminding you to join us for online worship on Sundays. I hope you enjoyed Food and Faith with Shante and, Pat and Chef Sharon um, for this past Sunday. I thought it was a lot of fun. I, I was like, man, I want to make some ribs. Um, but uh, and I, uh, her word to us of don't ever give up was very powerful as well. All right, um, I did receive one prayer request, and it was from someone. She said it's not anonymous, but she really is just wanting prayer for her daughters and her grandchildren that they remain safe in this time of COVID. So we want to uh, definitely lift her a particular request up, but for all those of us experiencing this right now. Um, I know, you know, I, I work part-time for Lyft. I also work part-time at a nursing home. So I've actually already been tested three times for COVID. Uh, uh, anyway, so let's, uh, let's pray. Let's close. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for um, the example of Jesus, of what true power looks like in your kingdom. It is a power that serves the least and the forgotten, that lifts up those who are hurting, who are sick, and brings healing to them. Uh, Lord, help us to be good news to the least and the forgotten. Let us not court the halls of power and those who um, wield power, particularly those who wield power over others uh, to, to bring harm to them. Uh, let us free people from oppression. Uh, let us be um, your light uh, to, to your kingdom, which is one who serves the least. We pray for all of those who've been affected by COVID. Lord, we pray for financial provision. We pray for um, jobs. We pray for those who are, are hurting and, and scared for their children and grandchildren, that they would not be fearful, but trust that you are the God who lifts us up and protects us and, and watches over us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, we will uh, see you next week. All right. So um, bye. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week. And um, we'll see you. see you soon. Bye.